Welcome to Bad Movie Beatdown. Now, if you watch my reviews, you might get the mistaken impression that bad movies are mostly confined to the United States. And I can assure you that's not the case. The British are far more capable of making turkeys that you cannot possibly imagine. And one of them is today's target, Parting Shots. Never heard of it? I don't blame you. I don't think most people in England know it exists. It's a black comedy from the notorious Michael Winner. Yes, Michael Winner, best known as the guy who directed the Death Wish series. However, he's not just a film director, oh no. He's also a restaurant critic and the face of insurance company Eshaw. Calm down, dear. It's a commercial. Calm down, dear. It's only an annoying catchphrase. Parting Shots is, to date, the last film that Winner has directed, apparently moving to restaurant criticism full-time. This is something film fans can be very thankful for when considering the quality of some of his later movies. He also wrote the script based off his own story, which means this terrible movie was his idea in the first place. It's astoundingly rare, so I record it off TV, as you can see by this ITV1 indent of fountains of piss shooting out of the ground. Now, though, it's a film featuring the very best of British, Michael Winner's Parting Shots. Passing shots grips you right from the very start. It's cancer, Harry. That's literally the first line of the movie. Set phases to laughter. This is the diagnosis of photographer Harry, played by Chris Ray. And like Debbie Gibson, he should probably stick to his day job because he has the charisma of a bowl of asparagus. So how long have I got? About six weeks. Six weeks? I can't believe it's not butter. Rhea also contributes to the soundtrack, providing the most melancholy opening to a comedy I've ever seen. Before I go... Are you laughing yet? Yeah, me neither. He doesn't like weddings. Not since his wife left him. My friend Bev lives two doors away, says he lost all his money too. Really? And so I salute my friend Mike. Bloody hell, that was a bit abrupt. I swear, I didn't edit that. The music literally cuts out like that. Really? And so... That's astonishing! To make matters worse, Harry is pretty much berated by everyone. Why do you make me look so fat and old? There's a shadow on my nose. I'm certainly not buying any of these photographs. I look dreadful in all of them. I guess that cancer can't come soon enough. Harry gets called up by his ex-wife Lisa, played by Diana Rigg. I'm not disturbing you, am I? <sighs> what do you want? Ugh, that's a flattering shot. It's nearly one o'clock now. That's not what your watch says. The following day, Harry takes photos of Lisa and her dog. I'm dying, Lisa. That's what you said when we split up. <laughs> so Harry tells childhood friend John about his condition. John is played by former Doctor Who, Peter Davison. I don't want to depress you, John, but I got cancer. I got six weeks left to live. Tell me you're joking. <laughs> I wish I was. Oh, God. I'm sorry, but what part of this is meant to be funny? Harry starts looking through his old photo albums, which brings back old memories. Bad ones. Get up! Look at Popsy Boots. You'll never be anything. Stupid! 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 Let's start a cheer! This movie is stupid! 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 stupid, 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 stupid. stupid, stupid. stupid. He then recalls another friend, Morris, who stole his ideas when they went into advertising. Yes, John Cleese. And you thought Pluto Nash was the career low point. Oh, James here. Aren't you early, sir? I will hand it to the movie. The guy they picked to play a young John Cleese is so spot on it's scary. Thank you, sir. The actor for Chris Rea. It was my idea. I did it all. Not so much. That's probably because they decided to dub the older actor over the younger version, which you should never do because 99% of the time it never works. Case in point, Diana Riggs double. These are fabulous, Harry. Gah! As if that wasn't bad enough, Winner keeps cutting between the older and younger actors. Combined with the dubbed voices, it becomes quite disorienting. Next is Gerd Layton, played by, oh dear, Bob Hoskins. Harry, people with me grow rich. Well, I've got £30,000 in the bank. You want my advice? Borrow another 20. Make it 50. I'll double it in two years. Oh yeah, he sounds completely trustworthy. Leighton loses all their money and Harry and Lisa's marriage starts to fall apart. At that point, John calls in, just as Harry gets an idea. In there are all the people who mugged me. Screwed me over. It happens to us all. I think I should kill them. That's actually a good idea. Congratulations, Michael Winner. You just drawn my death list alongside Andre Bartkoviak, Paulie Shaw and The Asylum. Harry walks into a bar with a proposition for barmaid Frida, played by Joanna Lumley. Saw this pub on TV last year. Very interesting programme. Work of art, not fact. 
Says you could come in here, buy a gun, just like that. Given that guns are highly illegal in the UK, how is she out of prison considering she was featured on TV? We should all be a little nicer to each other. Be responsible for our actions. Let some karma enter in. What about alternative Indian therapy? I know a guru in Sri Lanka. Gah! Abrupt, vaguely racist music cue! She gives him a gun. Harry calls Lisa to meet up with her the following day with the intention of bumping her off. Check out this superb acting from Diana Rigg in her death scene. dog walked in. That's funny. Or at least the score seems to think so. Harry puts the gun in a train station locker and comes back to see the police at his door. It's your wife, sir. She's dead. Do you like a glass of champagne? Chris Rea and his superb sense of comic timing. We're taking this very casually, sir. That's because you didn't know Lisa. How is this not blatantly obvious to them? Is that meant to be the joke? Well, what do you think? He's a nutcase. I can see why she left him. But I don't think he's a murderer. Oh, no, of course not. We'll just leave him to celebrate the death of his wife. Harry, tell me it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Thank God for that. I was lying. I murdered Lisa. You're joking. I'm joking. Thank God for that. I wasn't joking, really. It's true. Shudder. Jesus, this is meant to be a fast, witty exchange, but the way it's directed, it's slower than a turtle taking a shit. Harry and John celebrate by ordering some prostitutes. And if you think this is a mine of comic potential, don't worry, there isn't a single gag. Can you play back them? <laughs> You're not very good at this, are you? Or at least ain't that I detected, and I searched really hard. Harry decides he wants to knock off Gerd Layton. Layton's personal assistant, Jill, played by Felicity Kendall, recognises Harry and lets him in. Harry and his man boobies join Gerd in his pool as we witness the lighter side of drowning. I reckon I'll pay for half of this pool. It's only fair that we should share it. And you can have the bottom half. Seriously, slapping comedy music on murder does not make it funny. Hey! Most of the time. Jill catches Harry in the act, but she hated her boss, so she lets Harry get away with it by claiming it was a heart attack. The two spontaneously fall for each other. Because that Chris Rear is such an erotic dynamo, isn't he? I suffered Leighton for 12 years. Not a nice man. Took you 12 years to find out. He was fine at first. I even got my parents to give him their savings. They lost everything. My father committed suicide. The laughs never stop coming, do they? Why did you steal? The police were on him. I helped. I copy documents. That's how I met your wife. Lisa. She said she was going to do something. I was at her house just after you. I heard the shot. So you knew? She was a cow. Well, that makes her murder perfectly right. Anyway, she told me you only had six weeks to live. What's the point of turning you in? If evil people get what they deserve. Why should I care? That's not politically correct. So what? Maybe we should all go around killing people, eh, Michael? Harry wants to make sure that Jill's well compensated after he dies. Let's get fifty thousand pounds if you die. Is that all? If you die violently, it's three hundred thousand. What does that mean? If you die violently? Well, it's just here. Murder, killed during robbery, riot, earthquake, plane crash, that sort of thing. So if I get murdered. She'll get rich. Looks like it. Wow, I haven't seen a friend like this since Barry Pepper and Seven Pounds, and don't remind me of that abomination. Harry takes Jill out to a restaurant and see where this might be going. First, Harry's reservation gets lost. I'm afraid it's not here, sir. So he bribes his way in where he gets a poor seat. Then the waiters constantly ignore him and take forever to serve him. And when they do serve him, they get snobby. What is sauvage a la Hispaniol avec je regou? It's one of Renzo's specialities. But what is it? <sighs> Gee, was this made by a food critic? I never would have guessed! It in no way looks like a bunch of thinly veiled personal bugbears! When the food does arrive, it's barely able to be eaten. They complain to the head chef, Renzo, played by Jesus Ben Kingsley. Yo! Out! <laughs> <laughs> 
You know nothing about food, about life, about creation, about art, about colour, about dignity. You are total illiterate. Yep, yeah, that's my thoughts on Michael Winner. Oh, and the chef is clearly a caricature of uh, the chef that kicked Winner out of his restaurant. Bitter much? The pair get kicked out and they go to another restaurant, but Harry comes back to Renzo to settle the score, leading to Ben Kingsley's most undignified death scene. <laughs> You know nothing about kindness. You know nothing about decency. You know nothing about respect, manners, civility, courtesy. I can learn. Too late. You know, when you make a movie about shooting dead your enemies, you might want to afford a gun that fires to spare Ben Kingsley the indignity of being killed by a gunshot sound effect. This seems like the most callous killing because unlike the other victims, he wasn't a long-held grudge. Renzo was clearly written into the movie as a childish attack on Winner's front. We then get the brief but nightmarish sight of them having sex. <laughs> but the police are beginning to pick up Harry's trail. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm baffling you, Ray. Guess who Renzo attacked last night? Who? Oh. Harry Sterndale. Renzo was shot with the same gun that killed Sterndale's wife, Lisa. I don't believe it. You mean two rare shootings occur and they're both by the same gunman? That's unbelievable! As the police search Harry's house, Harry goes to see Frieda, who happens to have a hitman on her beck and whim, played by Oliver Reed. Incidentally, Reed died before this movie was released, which makes this comedy about death even less funny. Harry arranges with Jamie, the hitman, to have himself killed so that Jill can have the insurance money. Harry goes back home. Same gun that killed your wife killed Renzo Locatelli last night. A van, similar to yours, was seen near Leighton's house the day he died. Similar? It has his name on the side of it! It's pretty obvious! You come here, wreck my house. I'm a dying man, for Christ's sake. You know honour, no respect! There's certainly no evidence. Get out! I wasn't aware that if you just shout at the police, get out, they do just that. I have to try that sometime. Harry leaves the house, takes out all his money, and gets a room in a luxury hotel and buys Jill a sports car. He takes it out to a hotel in the country, but there's an ulterior motive. A friend of mine lives here. Stayed with him once. He was a school bully. Evil bastard. Made my life hell for years. Well, let's hope he's still an asshole then, or that might be a moral quandary. Prissy and Pissy! Oh look, he's wetting your car, that's not very nice is it? Oh that's good then. The following morning, Harry confronts the bully as he goes on his run. School, you made my life misery for years. Oh come on, nobody cares. I do. The fact is Harry, you're inadequate. Always were, always will be. Don't blame me, look at the mirror. You know why I came here today? I don't care. I came here to kill you. <laughs> well, you'll have to catch me first. No, I won't. Yeah, but what about the other bullies? Even in the flashback, there was more than one bully, and they seem to be worse than this guy because they pissed in his car. As a police officer twigs Harry's identity, Harry posts his gun away and disposes the car in a barn, buying a new one. The police look at the new victim. Another one of these upper-class idiots under investigation for share fraud. It's a good thing that none of these people were remotely decent, eh? That's President Slomov. That's his wife. Plot point. Harry collects his gun at the hotel. Wait, why did he post it rather than keep it on him? What if there was a postal strike? Give that to Jeremy. Is this the shooter? Tell him to use it on my job. That'll be extra. 500 quid. I thought as much. I thought he lost most of his money to Layton. How is he able to blow money left, right and centre like this? But just because he doesn't have a gun anymore doesn't mean that Harry's done killing people as he moves to Morris. And I hope you weren't expecting subtlety from John Cleese. Harry, uh, if you, you come round here to resurrect some grudge, I mean, look, if it's money, you can rely on me, OK? Have you no conscience? This is advertising. <laughs> Give me the gun and I'll shoot him myself. You kill me, Morris. No, you kill me, remember? Ha-ha! <laughs> Jesus Christ! I think John's just worked out he's working with Michael Winner. Oddly enough, Clee seems to have wanted to take his name off the film because he's the only main star who's not billed above the title, instead getting a tiny With John Cleese credit. I can't say I blame him, to be honest. 
In the night, Harry sneaks to Morris's home and puts a petrol-soaked cloth in the petrol tank. Jill waits in the car, but she gets recognised by police. Morris walks through his car, apparently not noticing the cloth blatantly sticking out of the car. Harry ignites the cloth and blows up the car. <laughs> I say that, this movie is too budget conscious to have an explosion, so just settle for hearing the sound of it and one shot of something vaguely burning. Run, Harry, run! Chris, Rhea running? You must be joking. Harry escapes and they take her into custody. This is not a frivolous matter, Miss Saunders. Five people have been murdered. Your friend is wanted for murder. You fight against evil, but your hands are tied. How many people who deserve punishment ever get it? If Harry killed anyone, it's because they killed a little bit of him. I call that justice. You know, there's a quite unsettling undertone that seems to advocate killing your enemies. At no point does Harry have any remorse or regret actually killing these people. The filmmakers are clearly aware of this by making his victims the scum of the earth, but it's simply not enough. I like what you said. About rough justice? Personally, I'll shoot the lot of them. The rapists. The murderers. Glad to see the director of Death Wish is still pushing that eye for an eye mentality. Harry goes to see his doctor to get a stronger prescription and calls John to get Jill out of custody. Oh come on! How do they miss that? He literally walked out right in front of them! As Jill is released with the police following her movements, Harry tells Jamie it's time for his assassination. But Harry has severe stomach pains and is taken to a hospital before the attempt can be carried out. What happened? They operated. I don't want to fight it. Harry, you haven't got cancer. My God, what a shocking twist! It's something I totally not guessed two minutes into the movie! The police come in, but here comes Jamie with another assassination attempt. What was that? <laughs> Oh, so no one hears that disturbance inside the room. The attempt gets foiled, shooting a cop, forcing Jamie to rush out. Harry and Jill escape in the chaos. We've got nowhere to go. Why? I killed five people. They can't prove it. I didn't even try to be discreet. What am I going to do? Oh, no, he's not regretting killing them. He's just bemoaning going to jail for it. He tells Jill about Jamie and fakes calling it off by calling John. I don't have cancer. He can keep the money. Just don't do the job. Get him on his mobile before it's too late. Harry, where are you? What was all that about? You see, the reason he hasn't called it off is because he doesn't want to go to prison. Makes you want to shoot him, doesn't it? I still can't believe you'd have yourself killed just for me. I'd do more. How? Get married? What if we have children? God damn it! Stop reminding me of that movie! But they picked a rather bad time to rush out and get an engagement ring as President Slomov is about to see the Queen through hordes of protesters, just so you know he's an asshole. Jamie hides in the crowd as a protester and for some inexplicable reason tries to shoot Harry through the President, killing Slomov. What a great hitman he is! Jamie gets arrested. You shot the President! It was on television! It's the most damning evidence I've ever seen. Your gun was used on other murders, Jamie. It shot Mrs. Lisa Stern down. It shot the chef. You also shot the sheriff, but you did not shoot the deputy. Jamie falsely confesses to the murders that Harry committed, but killing the present turns out to be a good thing. Mr. Stewart was today made a true girls demonstrated at Wormwood Scrubs Prison today for the release of serial killer Jamie Campbell Stewart. There are now 17 registered fan clubs for a man who's captured the heart of Britain's young set. So remember, if you kill bad people, you'll be celebrated as the hero that you are. By children, no less! I think I found a film was morally repugnant, seven pounds! A just married Harry and Jill see Jamie in prison. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to thank you. If there's ever anything we can do. There is. The name's on this. He's an absolute bastard. No sequel! So the movie ends with all three of them laughing. I think they're the only ones who are. Finally, a movie that celebrates the cold-blooded slaughter of your enemies. You can see how this might have worked. I mean, the concept has this sense of wish fulfillment. It's hard to get past the bad taste it leaves in the mouth, and the execution here is terrible. It's badly directed and edited, and it looks and feels cheap, wasting most of the cast. The star side cast only have one or two small scenes to set their assholeness, and then get killed off in ways that aren't funny, as much as the score tells us so. The whole thing, especially the score, looks like it's escaped from the 1970s. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere, and if your name's Michael Winner, I'm coming for you!
It's always funny. I hate you, Pilgrim.